Welcome to Learning As We Play and Age of Wonders 4. This came out very recently and I have had a lot of fun with this. I haven't really enjoyed a 4X game in a long while and this really fits neatly into what I like. Now, Learning As We Play, I, I play as best I know how and I tell you why I do what I do while I do it. So instead of showing you all the menus, all the buttons, all the things that might be going on, and explaining all that, I will just play and explain what I'm doing while I'm doing it. Now, Age of Wonders starts. Wonderful. We're not going to look into the campaign. We are going to play a free custom game, whatever. Uh, and we're going to create a race because that's one of the more interesting things about Age of Wonders. The story is basically the godier, some sort of god-like beings, the wizard kings they're sometimes called in this, uh, are returning to planes of existence and trying to build their kingdoms and whatnot. You are building your own pantheon, which will be stacked of all these races and characters and whatnot. Uh, but more on that a little bit later. So we are not going to do any of these things. We're just going to pick one of the realm one or two things. These you unlock later. Uh, these are the story realms, meaning the campaign. Uh, which you play through. The last one is a doozy and takes a whole lot of luck to get through. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take anything here. Let's take Idella. Let's select it. It has some features which tells us something. If we wanted to min-max, we could read on those features and be like, okay, I need to build my people like this or that. We're going to reduce the number of players a little bit just to make it less crowded for us in uh, turning this. Everything else we lo uh, take as it is. And now <laughs> here comes the interesting bit. You could just take a predefined class. I could take one I've built over time playing this. Instead, we're going to create one entirely new. Now, we have a bunch of races to choose from and they come with traits. These traits we can change. Uh, for this, we are going to be, I don't know, toads. Let let's be toads. Why not? These would be resilient and water adaptation, uh, unless we want something different. For this, we're just going to leave it at that. Resilient means, uh, and here, here's why I fell in love with Age of Wonders 4 here. Okay, something about Crusader Kings 3 that I really loved is the tooltip system. And Age of Wonders 4 does this as well. Thank goodness, I was so hoping this would catch on. And of course, it's a paradox game, so maybe there that's something. But I can move my mouse into the tooltip. Get info on this thing, and if there was more here, I could basically build this out forever. Oh, it's amazing. So, uh, status resistance means if they, they, they can't be as easily burned or something. Uh, water adaptation is for swamp terrain. It's quite good, and you can build farms on swamp, which other people would not be able to do. These are not all great, but it doesn't really matter. What is that origin culture? Now, the origin culture is uh, a bit of a mixed bag. It slightly determines your tech tree, basically, based on this little icon here, which stands for materium, this is called, and you have, like, nature and chaos and order and magic and shadow and all that. You can pick basically whatever you want, sort of, and later build away from this, but this determines how you start, pretty much. Uh, personally, I, I like most of these except dark, so we're gonna ch we're gonna use something a little bit decently balanced. So we're just gonna stick with feudal. All of these have their own benefits uh, displayed here in the tooltip. So we would have a lot of structures for food income, so our growth would be higher. I will. I'll talk about that later and some other benefits which we're not going to go into as much right now so keeping in mind that we just selected something that has one yellow and one green just remember the, uh, the colors we could build into that lean into that and, and pick more yellow and green without really considering any of what that needs we could also pick anything else what this means I will show you in a moment so for now we are going to d take something because I like it. I like the RP thing. Uh, they are adept settlers on my view because they can settle almost anywhere. They're, they're really good about that. 
And let's say they are also mm, what would be fun on a just an RP side of things. Let's say they are experienced seafarers as well. I mean, the frogs, obviously. They, why wouldn't they be? Now the tomes of magic are basically tech trees, as you as you know them elsewhere, and you basically walk through them. You don't get to all of them, but some of them. And here again, it makes sense to pick something that's aligned with what you have. At this point, we have three green. We have one green from feudal. We have two green from what we just chose: uh, adept hunters and adept seafarers, or whatever they were called. So. Um, Going in the green route would help us slightly, as it gives us more green, which I will explain in just a moment. And so, yeah, Tome of Beasts, we walk beside animals, and I think that's really kind of cute for frog people. So we'll start with the Tome of Beasts. Here, it's just very basic. Uh, more mana stuff, more non-mana stuff, basically. We're going to go with Champion. Uh, the thing that... Everything is a little bit dark. That's just how it is right now. We could customize this very, very, very quite deeply, honestly, um, with different icons and all that. You don't start out with these. You unlock a bunch through playing. Uh, for this purpose right now, we're just going to click the random button a few times, and this is who we're going to be. Now, one decision that is important, uh, because your ruler is actually a unit that you will have in combat with you in the game. One important decision is what do you use as your weapons. You don't start out with any of these that have the little icon here. Those you unlock by playing. But you could be a sword and shield, greatsword, bow, spirit staff, spirit orb. All of these are a little bit different. So this is basically your tank, your damage dealer, your range damage dealer. You are a support slash healer. You are a caster slash damage dealer. That's, that's really all what these determine. You will find better weapons down the line. For the moment, um, let's start with bow because they're hunters, right? So, makes sense. We'll select this. Again, we set whatever we want. We're just going to randomize this a little bit and just click onward. I've already spent a lot of time here on getting through this. But it's part of the game and it's, I think, one of the most enjoyable parts of the game. So, I like to go through it. Now, 4x, this is turn-based. Here we get some information on what we just picked uh, to go through again. The game picks from this tome several spells that we get. Um, Call of Glory is not from that tome, so I'm not entirely sure. Uh, let's first talk about the green and the, and the yellow, which I talked about. Up here you can see our affinity. Our affinity uh, directly influences something we get over here our our um skill tree basically and the skill tree is split into these color lines basically so one line is for green stuff one line is for yellow stuff so the higher your affinity the more points you generate each turn for that line so you progress through it faster that's that's really all the affinity does you needn't stress this too much now if you've never played a 4x game this might be a little bit tough for you to follow um, but I, I will try to be on a very low level. We have this city here, which we start out with. We have these two groups of units. One of these is a explorer type unit. And another one here is our hero with a bunch of units that can do unit related things. Then we have a bunch of stuff around our city. Uh, certain things that are interesting, like these sheep here, they run around. If you've ever played Settlers of Catan, you do know that sheep provide wool and not food, but in this, they provide food, which makes some sense because you can actually eat sheep. Then there are these glowy bits sometimes, where there's like a chest in here. This one contains an item. Now, I could use my hero or my uh, explorer to pick that up, but since every item we pick up goes into like a global pool from which we just draw, so you don't have to pick it up on the hero that you want to use it with, whatever is in there, uh, we can just pick it up with our explorer. And we picked up a crown, which will grant us plus one resistance if we take it. We could either just take it or we can click immediately on open hero screen, which leads us here. And the game very helpfully tells us, ooh, there's something new, click on me. 
Then we click on it, then it's no longer new because we've seen it now. We can click this, now we equip it. You don't see it on your character, but it is equipped. If we unequip it, you can see over here our resistance goes down because this gets us plus one. That's all that is to see here at the moment. Obviously, there's more, but we're not going to talk about it because it doesn't matter for us. Now, the scout is what we use to scout, obviously. Makes sense. So, we can tell him to auto-explore, which means he will just run around trying to uncover this fog of war here so you can see more of the map. Right now, our minimap is very small. This is not the whole map size. There's more going on here. You can see how far I'm scrolling, yeah? There's, there's a lot of stuff in this world which we haven't seen. Now, this is a little bit of a cheat because I know this is a big important thingy later. Uh, doesn't matter to us right now. So we're going to tell him to auto-explore. He doesn't do anything immediately. His turns will happen at the end of our turn. He will do his stuff. Bear with him. Now, the other thing that we want to do is use our ruler. Our ruler, he has experience. He has levels. So he's currently level 1, so he's not too well. We have two level 1 units and one level 2 unit. The ones are not all that strong, obviously, and the two one here is a support unit, so it doesn't really do much either. If we hover over an enemy army like this one here, that's sitting on top this pile of uh, magic items, we get this information here on how all this works. Will our army that we have currently win the battle? Yes, no. How likely is this? You get little numbers. We On our side, we have 295. On their size, uh, side, we have 200. So our number is bigger, so it means we're better. And honestly, we're going to just do this combat here. There's nothing else for us in reach for us to move to that would make sense. We have picked up the thing with our scout. And this yellow area here tells us how far we can get on this turn. Everything outside... So you see it turns red and it tells you how many turns it would take beyond the current one to get there. So if we if we wanted to go here, we would have to wait one more turn to get there. So obviously we want to maximize the time that we that we get on each turn, so we will attack. Another thing, just to point it out real quick, there's this red area. If if either of us had another army in here, they would count in this battle as well. Up to three armies can engage with one another. And with this out of the way, let's start. So I just right-click this boy here. Then we get this battle option. We can say auto combat, uh, which is fairly okay, though I made the experience that the AI likes to throw your heroes into the meat grinder. So instead, just to show the game a little bit, we're going to do manual combat. And personally, I like the early game manual combat. Uh, later, it's a little bit too complicated for me with all the spells and buffs and debuffs and whatnot you got going. But early on, there's not too much and it's kind of fun. It's also looking fairly decent. So, uh, first the enemy moves and they go around. You can tell they have these little icons here. So these are uh, skirmishes, meaning they can both melee and range attack. That's good to know for my own positioning. So, looking at this map, there are several features here. Certain things block our movement, like the stones. Others will hurt us, like these uh, poisonous mushrooms. If we walk through them, we get poisoned for three turns, which is quite a lot of damage, honestly. Uh, but there are also some other things, like these uh, clovers here, which give us a critical hit chance if we stand in them. Or uh, this foliage here, uh, which is obscuring, meaning uh, they are much harder to hit if we stand in there. So we know that these are ranged attackers. Uh, we have a lot of foliage right here, where we don't even have to move all that far. So, what we're going to do for now is we're going to move our group into the foliage here. And something to note, if you've played these before or not, uh, your your units have a, have a direction in which they're looking. And if they're attacked from, you can see on the hex here, from this, from behind, or from either of the sides here, from these three positions the enemy gets an advantage and attacks harder. So if they come around here and attack from the side, they might get a better deal out of it. So we're going to click this button here and we're going to change the direction our units are looking. Now, I would like a, a position like in between here. It's not great. And you also have to left click to do this, which is a little bit weird. Uh, no, you have to right click to do this, which is all a little bit confusing. Anyway, we move them so they're looking this way now. You can kind of see by how the wedge is formed. Uh, hopefully, the enemy is going to come like this. So, 
they're fine. Now, our hero is a ranged hero as well. We're going to just stand them here in a little bit lower foliage. We're going to turn them as well and put them on this defensive stance because I want the enemy to just come up here. I will move these. If I right-click again after issuing a move movement, uh, they kind of speed up their, their, uh, their animation to get there quicker. See? Just double right-click and they do their thing. Now these here, they are a buff unit and they buff things within their own range. I could have done this better and the AI, if you let it do it, usually shows you. Uh, they just rearrange their groups to maximize buffs. Um, but we're not doing that. So we're letting them come and they are very happily running through the poison here. Um, so that's interesting, like some ran through here, but they're coming straight for us. now. We are in battle range, and we are kind of safe from them. Where we are standing, you see the white area, the, the little dotted line. This is the range of our hero. Because he has a bow, he can attack ranged. Now, several things to consider. Right now, where he stands, he has an 80% chance to hit any of these. So, all of these are pretty good for me to hit. Um, you can see down here, there's a dot, and there's three kind of half moonish kind of things. And there's one dot for a thing. Now, what does that mean? Any action you take, you can see beneath my mouse cursor is a little bar with, with dots again. Every unit you have, you can see these under here, has a certain amount of actions it can take per turn. So, um, you start if you stand still with three action points, basically. If I moved here, I would have one remaining as highlighted by the thing underneath my uh, cursor there. What I don't want to do is do that because um, this attack here, it uses at least one dot, but as many dots as it has available. That's what this means. So if I attack from here, I will do much more damage than if I move over there, get 100%. Um, so it's a little bit of a trade-off. From here, I have a 20% chance to miss. So I might lose. And it's not like the whole attack. It's each of the attacks it's going to do. Since we have three dots available, it's going to attack three times. And each of these attacks has a chance of 20% of missing. But we're going to take that uh, gamble. And we're going to attack these boys. Because I have a feeling that these might be the ones walking into the Lucky Clovers. So we'll see. So now he attacks once, twice, three times. He says, uh, it said grazed. Which is a form of failure. It didn't fail, it just didn't... Um, turn out the full damage that it might have. That's all that meant, basically. Uh, so for now, I want to shuffle these around a little bit. Uh, these here, we will move over there. And they are uh, like, a, like a support unit, so if I put them in this defensive stance, they make a little circle, and anything standing in there gets a buff. We leave them here. They don't have anything to do right now. And I don't want to move these out of cover. So we'll leave them here too. So chances are these guys are going to come in and pound the hero. So let's see. We have a buff spell here. Uh, it gets uh, strengthened and morale in a one hex radius. Ah, That doesn't help us because strengthened is um, increasing damage rather than anything else. It would help us for later turns. So instead of wasting it, we're just going to cast it and try and get all our units. So everyone has morale and strengthen now for three turns. Again, I right click to speed up the movement here. And my uh, assumption was wrong. They are not moving as I expected. But they're all pretty much attacking the hero. Almost. Which is fine, by the way. Because as you notice, some of these units have several unit creatures in them. And this guy is alone. Now, there's a difference. Uh, if he dies, he's dead. If they lose health, they slowly deteriorate. They get less. And like a unit of three, if one of these guys dies, they lose a third of their attack power, basically. Um, so you want them as full as possible. And these guys are good for tanking because, uh, well, they, they don't die as easy. Now, we can attack these for 100% and 42 or these for 100% of 42. It doesn't really matter. We definitely want to take out the guys in the in the clovers uh, first. So we'll attack these guys first. Now notice the hero turns a little bit toward what they're attacking. So in that sense, it might not have been the best idea. Because all these can now flank my hero. That's something I'm not considering all that much. So he'll take more damage from these guys. But 
We have a plan. We have a plan. Now, first, instead of just shooting them with my bow, I'm going to check if maybe these guys can kill them because he's the only one in range for these guys. And yes, they can actually kill them. So we'll, we'll send our spearmen here out of their hidey hole and we'll attack these guys there. So that's good. Meaning we can now use our bow, go uh, bow guys here and attack the dudes back with the 70%. Still not ideal, but uh, the other guys couldn't have reached anyone else. So it's an it's a okay trade-off. So we shoot them. Okay, two decent hits. That's fair. Uh, right. Now, we have a few more options to do with these guys. We could attack with them. Uh, as you can see, they're not too great at that. This would be a fairly decent attack and worth considering. Because if we hit for the full damage, this group gets reduced. Meaning they deal less damage to us. Which is great. But it is only a 30% hit chance because these guys are hidden down here in the trees. So instead, what we're going to do is these guys have a soothing standard. So we're going to move them here. Right there. And then we're going to use this, giving our hero a little bit of health back. And some morale. Which is good. Because he's going to need it because he's going to get hit in the face in just a second. Uh, we're not going to use all that much more mana, maybe... Okay, maybe we'll we'll use the mana on on these guys here, the ones that have the most health, uh, giving them distracted and sundered defense. Sundered defense reduces their defenses, and distracted means no matter from where we attack, it always counts as flanked because th they're just kind of standing around watching the birds instead of doing what they're supposed to be doing in this battle. So we end our turn. They come in now for a melee attack rather than a ranged. Again, these are skirmishers. They can do both. And as I said, not ideal. The positioning of my hero. <laughs> uh, they're all flanked. Now, something more interesting is happening. Uh, even more than everything else I've already told you. First, we're going to go attack. Um, and we're going to attack these boys here. Because we deal a lot more damage on them than on them. I'm not entirely sure why. Because we're flanking these boys. So I I wouldn't know. But we're going to attack here. You can see the retaliation thing. So we attack them. They're going to hurt us back. Uh, just as much as our units that are not flanked would hurt them back. But it's a little bit of a pain that we get. So that's fine. And there it goes. Now... We have a bit of a problem on our hands. First, we're going to turn our hero. So we, we, we're not flanked as much anymore. Second, you see, I can't shoot my bow anymore. Because the enemy is within the zone of control. If you ever play Dungeons and Dragons, that just means while they're within a space of me, like directly adjacent to me, I can't move away from them without them getting an opportunity attack. Uh, denoted by those red uh, little swords there on the ground. And I cannot use certain amounts or, or certain types of attack. Like my ranged attack. Can't use that anymore. Uh, if they are like these boys, they can't use their spell attack anymore because these are stopping them from it. And if I move away, you can see they're highlighted red. Meaning that these guys are going to attack on opportunity. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the quick stab attack and hit this boy. Again, we get a little bit of retaliation damage. That's fine. Now we're going to use our bowman to kill this unit. Which gives us all morale. That's fine. And now these are no longer in zone of control there. So these can attack again or they could bolster. Um, which is, a, is an interesting option. Question. Do we, uh, do we bolster ourselves here? Get more physical defense? I don't know how much that actually is because it doesn't say us. Tell us. Or we attack. Again, reducing the number of units in this reduces the damage they deal. So, in this case, I'm going to opt to attack these boys here. Um, making them a little less functional, basically. Everything else here is fine. We're just going to turn. We're not going to use another spell. Alright, they chose to run around us to flank us. Okay, I can deal with this. Um, now, we are going to flank them. Because these boys aren't really good for all that much else. And they landed a crit there. 
so that's good. They dealt more damage than was uh, anticipated. Next, we're going to use this unit here to kill these or these. It doesn't... It does matter slightly. We have less of a chance of hitting these than these. So I'm going to take the better chance, kill these. Lowering their morale. Morale over here, you can see there. It's um, it's important. It, it gives critical chance and reduces chance on hit, I think, if it goes low. So we'll move this around, our hero now. And we're actually going to move him in. It's not super ideal because we are ranged hero, but if we move, we lose the attack points anyway. Though we could try. Let, let's, let's try. We'll move here so we get two attack points still. And attack and see if we hit and hopefully kill this unit. Yes. There we go. That's the unit dead. Not an ideal victory. Not an ideal victory. We took a lot of damage because of my bad positioning there in the beginning. Uh, but some of our units increased their rank, which is nice, which gives them some bonuses. And we didn't lose anyone. So that's a decent outcome. It's not great, but it's decent. And we got some mana uh, that's going to be important later. And we moved all our move, so that's fine. Now the game wants us to select Arcane Research. Uh, yeah, the options here are are kind of wide. Uh, what we want to do is go the nature route, because that's kind of where we, we're good at. At the moment, we could do anything, really. We could also use Hold the Line, which is from, uh, from our yellow affinity, basically, which is kind of fine. Uh, it gives us a spell that units cannot fall below one hit point. Um, that's pretty strong. That's really, really, really strong, honestly. So it's something to consider. Um, having more units, better units, is also pretty cool, but we can build them. So we're going to go with this. I, I thought this had like a like a maximum time on it, but it doesn't. It takes a while. It takes seven turns for us to research because it's a high-level spell already. And we don't produce all that much research. Now, our city here, it has a little number right there. It says two. Meaning it can have two areas because it has two people living in there. One living in the center and the other population we send somewhere. If we click on it, this is very similar to other 4X games. So you just kind of pick whatever is around here to start on it. Now... I'm sure there's optimizing ways of doing this. Personally, I like to go with the RP sense. I like to uh, go with what makes sense in the start here. And I don't fuss too much about optimizing this. One thing to keep in mind, however, when making the choice is when building buildings that improve your city further, these have something down there called boost. See over here. So if we have one forester, this will take less time and less money to build. That's that's the baseline you might want to consider when making choices early on. Later, it doesn't matter as much anymore. It does still matter, but a little bit less in my opinion. So for now, we're going to check and we have a bunch here where it says one farm, one forester, one quarry. Uh, so I like to get money in production early. So we're going to go for a farm. And since we have this little sheep herd here, if we take this farm, uh, we get a little bit more out of it. Now, mind you, I could also build the quarry and still get the 10. But the quarry only boosts one of these things. Uh, this one here. Which isn't a bad thing to boost. But if we build the farm, we get two boosts. That's really all to consider here. You, you always get... Unless it's occupied, the thing that is in here, no matter what you build, it doesn't have to fit. You don't have to build a farm to get the 10 from the sheep. Doesn't matter. You don't have to build a mine to get gold. You don't have to build a quarry to get iron. These always matter, which I really like. I enjoy that. Um, but also thinking ahead, you're spa later you're going to get special uh, improvements, which you can override with. Like you can upgrade a farm basically to something else. And Sometimes they are like, if there are others of the same kind, then it's even better. So making some choices early on on where to put what will matter later on. So if we pick a farm here, 
we might want to pick a farm there later. And then a farm there later, so we have three farms, one of which is connected to two of them, so this would be a good spot to build a special improvement. Which we know might be coming because we chose a greenish route and a feudal route, and the game told us that's a lot of food related stuff coming up, so we'll keep that in mind. For now, we're just gonna take the sheep here, and what food does is it speeds up the population growth in the city, meaning we can attack more stuff, meaning we get better and stronger. Um, I think there's more to population, honestly, but I haven't really looked into that. Um, for the moment, uh, it costs us some food and some uh, happiness. So every time we annex one of those little thingies, it reduces our happiness, our stability. There will be buildings which with, with which we can boost that. Um, just so you know, you can't expand forever without addressing happiness, basically. So now, these are boosted. And in my opinion, it makes sense we start with something that increases production speed early on. We're not going to spend all the money we have on this now. Uh, we're going to put both the boosted buildings in this queue. That's fine. And we're going to queue up another unit for us to use. Now, we have a bunch of ranged already in our army. Our hero is ranged. Our support is ranged. Our archers is ranged. So we're going to start with another pike unit. We could also get another scout to get more um, more landmass explored. But yeah, I, I, I like going like that. So this was our first turn. It's always a lot in these strategy games. Honestly, it, it goes down. These are the basics. Now you know most of what's important. Uh, we're gonna do another turn. And you can see our army just turned into a ship. Because this is something other races will have to unlock later. But since we are experienced seafarers, uh, we get to land and ship immediately. So our scout just immediately turned into ship. And he's going to sail around here and explore the ocean for us and maybe pick up this little sunken ship over there. Uh, all that good stuff. Now, there's something over there that we noticed, maybe. There's this red line existing. Meaning, somewhere here is an infestation, they call it. Like, there's maybe a bandit camp or something. Right now, they're sleeping. They haven't wake, woken up to being really mad and mean. So, we have a chance, if we, if we catch them early, to remove a danger to our settlement here, early on. So we're going to go this direction and have a little look if we can't find them. Now what we find first is this level 2 big bad bird, which we will take care of in the next turn. And some more resource nodes and all that kind of stuff. The area that we see right now when clicking on this is how far they can go if they go. But the boys that sit on these nodes, they never go anywhere. They also don't attack you unless you attack them. If their flag is red, we're going to see that in a moment then they might move and attack you. But if they're just this kind of dirty, brownish, darkish, reddish, really dark red, then no. The color of dried blood. They they have had their fill. Now, right now, we can't do anything else in this turn. Uh, we could look through all the buttons. We're not gonna because that's not how I play this game. Instead, you can see opponents are moving. Things are being calculated in the back. Our boys are flying around here, sailing around. Now the ship is protected by another flock of birds, so they can't do anything here. So first, since we won't be able to reach and attack the bandit camp, we can see it's right at the edge of how far we can go. So we're not going to get to attack them as well. We can move there, but not attack them. So instead, we're going to check this, and this is an easy battle for us. Some easy experience. Now, interesting thing happened right there. You saw the 80 when I hovered over it, and now it's suddenly 180. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. You can tell here that this army has units in them with this little eye here that are only seen when you're standing right next to the army. You can have that too later uh, with certain um, technology and, and spell work and all that kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. Completely underestimated the size of the army here because we figured, oh, it's just this bird. We can attack this. Now, we can still take these, but it's going to be more difficult and more dangerous. Uh, we could auto-combat, which we're going to do right now, because I just want to show you that I do that as well a lot. Uh, you can tell the AI to allow you to use spells. Why would you not want that? Maybe because spells cost mana. And sometimes you need the mana, 
and you don't want the AI to use them in battle. But now we're allowing it, it's fine. And it achieved victory, but at some cost, we lost our pike people. I'm not sure I could have done better. If I thought I could, I could just click retry. But something really, really cool I want to show here, which made this game quite enjoyable to me, is the watch replay. Honestly, it's actually quite fascinating to see. And we're going to do that now. If it's a little bit like playing an auto battler, and I really enjoy auto battlers for some reason. So we can watch this, see how the enemy acts if we wanted to. And then if we feel like, nah, the AI made really weird choices here. Those don't make any sense to me. Why did the AI do this? I would have done this differently and the outcome would have been different. Then you can. Because it's fun. And I really like this. Um, you don't have to watch it. You can just retry right from the get-go and then do an auto uh, manual combat. Uh, but I like this. I, I like seeing it like this. I like um, making up my own mind. Because sometimes I don't know what the enemy is even capable of. So I might not know if I could have done better, right? So right there, I think that was a really good move. Uh, taking out the, the bird really early because that was the strong unit here. And I'm curious to see how these pike people died because... I don't know. Right now, this, this looks really, really good, uh, from my opinion. But I just might be wrong. We'll see. See, I still don't know how the pike people died, because that looks all really, really good to me. Okay, that was probably a problem right now, that he missed this attack. So these are pretty strong still. So that's how they die, I will assume. Maybe a critical hit or something. Yeah, there we go. That's how they died. Okay, I would have done almost the same thing, probably. I don't think I would have made different choices. I, I wouldn't have expected them to do that much damage. So, uh, something to note. He didn't hit really well there. And they are not two. One, they're standing in foliage. Uh, it's not high foliage, but it is some, so they are covered. Plus these obstacles here. They also reduce the effectiveness of ranged attacks. You can mitigate for that later on. There are certain improvements to your race that you can do that take away... All of these entirely. Uh, you can also destroy these things in which they're standing. So there are some options. But for now, it is what it is. And we have to deal with it. So very good. I'm, I'm happy with this. We found a Frost Great Axe. Which is okay, but not something we can use right now. Uh, notice that down here it says Disable Slot. So if we wanted to use it, and we could. Right now, our hero is basically... Uh, a free agent. He doesn't have any skills yet. We just level up to level 2, so we can make our first pick on what to do. Um, but he couldn't have a mount, and we can't have anything in the offhand. Uh, we get some things, and it could be worthwhile. Now let's do the leveling up. Since we are feudal, and only because we are feudal, we have some extra options here, which we're going to look at. Otherwise, you would pick from warfare, battle magic, or support. You can mix and match as you like. It doesn't really matter. Whatever you think is cool, you do that. You don't have to go all fighting for ranged attacks, um, which isn't actually... We start out with Archery 1, which doesn't show up anywhere here, but we have it because we, we are going to be able to do Archery 2 eventually. Uh, but we have to spend one more Warfare skill point to unlock it. But I don't have to. We can just leave him with this and, and start going into support, for example. If we wanted to, we, we can absolutely do that. Um, for example, we could give everyone experience while they're just in the army, making every unit with us stronger. Stuff like that. Um, but since we are feudal, we're going to pick one of the feudal options. And he is the governor of our main city. And I really enjoy that we can just make him Lord of Crops. So the city he is governing gets 25 plus food. That's a lot. That's a big boost early. We're going to see just how much in a moment. So we're going to spend this one point here. Arguably, it makes the feudal lord heroes a little bit weaker. But only ever so slightly. And the boons are amazing uh, what you get here. So that's all for the leveling up. We're not going to use the axe, so that's fine. But let's check our city again. We're currently producing 81 food. 25 of this. 
is from our hero. That's almost 30% or more. Uh, so that's that's crazy. That's absolutely a lot. That's insanity. Now, uh, we're building here. And we could look ahead again. Like, there are things that cost us two farms, obviously. The things that come after these, the next level of these, will want two farms to be boosted. We could do that. Or we could be like, okay, let's... Let's first start out with building up the lower level rung of things here and then later we level up a little bit higher. That's an option. So we could go, for example, to build a forester instead to get uh, the market and the library. Uh, the library and the storehouse, I meant, sorry. And that's not a bad idea because the granary, uh, rather the storehouse, gives us 10 food. So that's not, that's not terrible. Uh, we're not going to need a mine very soon. Though keep in mind... We will not be able to build a mine anywhere. A mine can only be built in a node where there's a gold. Which I don't see right now elsewhere in, in the vicinity here. Like over there is one. So if we build around like this, eventually we might get another gold node for this city. But right now we only see this one. So we might want to consider putting, not putting a forester here. But for now, and that's the fantastic thing, we are gonna, because you can change these later. With whatever. So, right now, a forester helps us more than a mine. Because we get the 10 gold from the gold mine. From the node. And we get the advantage from the forester that we need to boost the early buildings here. We can later change it. If we need it, we can change it. Because we already got the boost, right? We, we already had the, the tax return, basically. They can't take that away from us. Um, so our guy here wants some orders. Now, we are a little bit hurt, and we're a little bit low. And we are soon having another unit here, which we will then reinforce. So we are going to move back into our own terrain, into our own area, onto the gold node. And we're going to wait here, because they regenerate more in your own territory. The evil presence here just tells us bandit camp, and I right-click to move it away. Because I don't want to look at it. Now... We are on turn three. So now we get Empire Development. And now come the green and the yellow again. If we click on this, this is just your basic skill tree, as you know, from so, 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 so many games. Um, and we are green. Yeah, we can zoom in here as well, make it a little bit closer, and you just turn around, left click, down, and move. Uh, you can also, no, you can't use WASD. But here again, the green. Now, we slowly build along this path, and we build slowly by, very simple, we have five green, you can see up here, five green, five green, so every turn we get five green, and we currently have ten. Meaning, this one here to unlock, just to get there, costs us ten green. Until we can unlock this one, takes us two more turns, because it's twenty green we need to have, basically. It's not food. It's green. Well, it's affinity, but... It's green, basically. Now, another resource we have is Imperium over here. It's just a little crown thingy. We get 40 of that each turn. This doesn't affect how fast we grow into these. This just means what can we afford. Again, we're already seafaring. Because uh, this is what we do with being experienced seafarers, right? So we don't have to unlock this. We are saving... 50 Imperium, because this would be also a 50 Imperium skill. Um, and our people can already do that. The, the general one, everyone has. And it's always plus 6, I, I believe. because Well, it's not always plus 6, because it's an accumulation of everything. I just noticed. Or it's 6 plus the accumulation of everything, because... No, we get plus 6 per turn, so I'm assuming it's these, and it's kind of under there. Yeah, I think general is just whatever you have. The more affinity you have, this goes quicker. This has some stuff, basically, we're going to talk about eventually. Right now, we can do this. Now, this says, founding or absorbing cities takes minus two turns. Newly founded or absorbed cities gain plus one population. Just this second, it is not important to us. It doesn't matter, <laughs> because it will take a moment until we do form a city, including because founding a city costs 200 Imperium. So if we buy this for 50... We are 50 less close to founding a new city. But with the two extra turns, maybe 
So we're gonna click on it and buy it. It'll be helpful later. Now this keeps kind of standing there until you click it or there's really nothing left. And we are kind of zoomed up here in the edge. You can kind of cheat a little bit. Like, you know, okay, over here, hopefully there's no other player. Maybe we get all this island bit here to ourselves. But maybe there's another player here. That might not be ideal for us because it's kind of cramped. And this is how we start in Age of Wonders 4, really. Next thing we want to do, if you're not willing to watch more of this, I know the first one was kind of long, but I wanted to say all the things I said. Next thing we want to look for is founding a new city. So we want to build an outpost for which we have to sit our hero on one of these spaces, or one of these unoccupied, and then we just build the outpost. And out of the outpost later, spending 200 Imperium, we will form a new city. Ideally, I will send our hero deeper in here and we're going to find and look and see whether or not there's something there. This little tower here is watchtower, so that's not necessarily a player. And hopefully there's no one here. Because then we got all this bit here, basically. All this, all this here would be ours and fairly safe as well, maybe. There could be an underground empire, but for now that is that. So let's do another turn, because that's the addictive bit. Always the other turns. I don't actually enjoy turn-based gameplay all that much, I, I must admit. Um... But sometimes, certain games just do it right, and then it works. So we're going to sit here one more turn to heal fully up. It's a little bit potentially wasted, but only potentially. We build our pike. I sent them there into our army to reinforce. Let's start building some more pikemen, because these are going to die a lot, as is tradition for any feudal system. We have no Imperium to spend. That's fine. We're still researching our research. So let's get going and keep going. And now, since we want to go a little bit deeper, we can also go a little bit closer to the bandit camp and have a look here. Now, this is the difference I said about the red and the not so red. Like, this is dried blood, this is active blood. So these guys, these are angry boys. They're gonna attack eventually. But we can't attack them right now because our movement is up. So we have to wait. But right now they have the little zzzr there. They're sleeping. This camp isn't active yet. Once it goes active, it grows. And if it grows into your area, they're gonna come for your area. Uh, they're not gonna leave the area, but they're gonna come for what you got. Now, back to this little mini game here. I want to build the uh, clergy commons. So next we're gonna build a quarry and we're gonna build the quarry on the iron depot. Not because it's just, I, I want to. That's all. Another new Imperium skill is available, and we're gonna take that one too, because it gives farms a plus five food, so our main city grows quicker. Meaning, we're set back again to founding a new city. But that's okay, we haven't found a point to do that yet. Our army has disembarked, and sometimes they find things, so it gets added to our treasury, the food gets transferred to our city, all that good stuff. All right. Next turn, now we can attack here. Low risk, again, we're just gonna do auto combat. And again, we lose one pike. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have done any better. Ooh. We get a spider hatchling. Which is a little bell. So we can at attach this now. And uh, in combat, we can spend three action points uh, to summon a tier 1 spider. Plus we have a level up, so let's check this out. Here's a fighting person. Let's check this real quick. Pack leader. Cavalry and animal units. That might make sense, because we're gonna go for animal units a lot. Uh, plus 10% hit. Critical. For himself too, because... And they get flanker. Extra damage on flanking. Let's do that. That's a that's a good thing. We got the we got the spider, which is you have to click confirm down there. I always forgot in the beginning. Click confirm, or they're not gonna apply, which is a little bit weird. Okay, so we're we're slightly stronger now, but also weaker because we lost our pike dude. So right now we can see we're not really up to scratch against anyone, but we also don't need need to really heal, and we don't need to fight anyone here because that's fine. 
let's move a little bit deeper. And we have found a free city. Uh, these are close by to us, so they're of the same race for us, which is nice. So they are kind of aligned to us. Uh, here's a little fluff text. We're not going to go into that right now. Instead, we're going to see the city itself. It sits right here. That's fine. That's an okay. And we can give them a whispering stone. We have one of those currently. We can upgrade them and get more through Imperium. And what this does is improves our relationship continually. And eventually over time, they're just gonna be our vassals unless there's someone competing and doing it quicker than us. In four turns, we're gonna have a pact of cooperation. We leave it at that. I don't think there's anyone else here in, in proximity who will soon compete for that. So that's okay. Right now, we can't really do battle around here because stuff's dangerous and our army is weak. So we are just going to walk deeper and look for an outpost spot. And yeah, we're going to do a long one today. I think an hour. This will be an hour. Oh boy, if you're still here, man, I love you. Or lady, or other. I love you, all the same. Right, let's check this again. We've got a bunch of stuff boosted, which is lovely. We can start thinking ahead a little bit. So let's build a second farm. Also, because a second farm will boost the growth. So we grow quicker. Plus, if you remember, we have this thing increasing the farm output even further. So these are just really, really good value for the money. And already we are almost at 100 output. So uh, this, this place is going to grow something fierce. We can't move any here. Uh, we need to set production. We need to build something. And let's think about this real quick. More food? Good. We want more food. More money? Also kind of good. But I would also like to speed up our research. That's terribly slow. So for now, let's build all the things that just cost 42 gold and take two turns. I think that's a good idea. So we're going to build the library first. And then the plus five mana, plus five gold. Uh, the clergy commons here is a feudal structure. That's not something everyone's going to have. Most, some of these are the same, like market, stone, mace, and all these are kind of everyone gets that. Later, it goes a little bit different. Now, this might be a good idea. The town hall castle too, because this unlocks the tavern, which in turn improves our city stability. So we might go for this one next and it's already boosted. Plus it unlocks us more troops, higher level units. So that's a good idea. Let's get going. And now we get a bunch of events basically dealing with this free city. And um, she is talking about a high stakes wizard and kings game. And clearly she doesn't know what she's doing. So we can beat her and get the gold, which reduces the allegiance. We can let her win, which means we lose money because we bet it's a high stakes game. But we, we immediately get the Pact of Cooperation, which gives us trading. And um, yeah, we're going to do that. We could also humiliate her so we get the money. We get some Imperium because we're so good and great. But the allegiance goes down and we're evil at the end. And so, no, no, we'll let her win. That's fine. So we can trade with them now. Now this button here is, is available for us. And they have a rainbow clover. Um, which is funny because it gives 100 relations with free cities. It's up here, relations. Uh, the better it is, the better it is, basically. Um, I'm not sure if it improves our allegiance growth rate. Relations respectful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they would grow in, really, uh, in allegiance. So if we pay them for this, uh, 150 gold, basically. 10 times 15, that's 150, yes. Um, they become quicker aligned with us. So we're going to do take that trade. Um, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> All right. Now, our new frog boys need orders. So we're just going to send them out kind of toward our main unit. You can see these boys here. <clears throat> they are actually from this free city. They're just sitting on here. They're just blocking these so no one else can use them. Which is kind of mean, if you ask me. So we're going to bring these armies a little bit closer together. So on the next turn, 
it'll be easier to join them up because if we lose all turn points, if we use all turn points to join them, then the army into which we join them doesn't have any movement points left, even if this one didn't move. So that's something to consider. We produced the pikemen. They are there. We acqui acquired the rainbow clover by trading with these guys to make them our friends even quicker. And here's the negotiation negotiations update because we got the pact of cooperation quicker. And that's it. So now we have seen a whole bunch of things that are going on in Age of Wonders 4. If you enjoyed this at all, I sure hope you did. I think it's a worthwhile game to pick up. If you're not entirely sure, just watch more of this. There's going to be more of this. And I promise the next few episodes are going to be a little bit shorter than this one. But yeah, leave a like if you liked it. Throw a comment. Are you playing this? Would you like to play this? Is there something you are curious about that I didn't mention here? Uh, yeah, let me know. And I hope to see you around next time. Until then, have a very great day. And good night. And bye-bye.